Medical cannabis is a huge issue with veterans, as it is often the most effective treatment for both pain and PTSD. So we're proud to bring you profiles of veterans who are making waves in the cannabis industry by helping to make things better for other veterans. Welcome to the Dispense Magazine podcast. I'm your host, former Navy journalist and Petty Officer First Class, Sven Haas. And today I'll be talking with Eric Asher, a veteran of Desert Storm who survived the darkest night of the soul to become a fierce proponent for the only medicine that actually works for him. In this podcast, Eric will tell that tale of darkness and what brought him back to the light now on a limited income he has learned how to triple the yield of the dry flour he purchases in authorized pennsylvania dispensaries with the help of a rosin press so stay tuned for a powerful story of survival and some great tips for medical cannabis patients we spoke in march 2019 at the mind body and holistic healing expo in monroeville we're talking with a great guy great influencer here eric asher You've got quite a story and quite a following, and you're right now known as the, uh, I like to call you the Sasquatch. <laughs> so, wait, sauce, sauce Squash. There sauce we go. Squash. You're the Squash you Master. Yeah, people call me the machine. There's all kinds of names people <laughs> give to me because of what I do. Uh, well, give us a little bit of your background first before we get into the, the, sure. s- the, the squashing. Uh, you're a, a veteran. I am uh, Desert Storm. Desert Storm? I was in the Army. Okay. Uh, I was in field artillery. I ran a rocket launcher during the war. Um, came came out of the Army in 91. And okay. um, got a degree in business administration. Tried to go the, the, the route of the way things should be, mm-hmm. you know. Do, you know do get your degree, get in the right. business world. But see, my... My PTSD and, and uh, emotional issues after the war that were undiagnosed and untreated at that time mm. caused me to be unemployable, basically. I mm. just couldn't keep a job. Um, a lot of depression during the early 90s. The, the early 90s were a very bad time for me because mm-hmm. I, I went from being a soldier and that, that was sort of a calling for me. Mm. And due to no fault of my own because of the exposures and the damage to my lungs, I wasn't able to do that anymore. So, What, what was the exposure? Was that the oil wells? There were oil wells smoked. There was sarin gas, which is nerve mm. gas. Um, we were inoculated against a lot of uh, oh, things that right. using experimental yeah. inoculations. There was uh, paradistigmine bromide tablets that were supposed to protect you from nerve agent, mm-hmm. but ended up causing neurological problems. Like mm. I have calves that never stop twitching and I have short-term oh. memory problems and those are all side effects from this at the time unapproved untested drug we were guinea pigs so there was a lot of issues coming out of the war and there there hadn't been any research into Gulf War illness so the VA kind of turned its back on us for 20 years Mm. I fought for disability from 1992 and didn't get approved until 2009 Wow! in the intervening time I fell into kind of a um, self-destructive spiral of drug use and depression and and it culminated in in me being homeless in 1994 for about a year Mm. and i tried to take my life at that time and Mm. ended up uh, in a va hospital over at highland drive when it was still operating Mm -hmm. here in pittsburgh Uh, they had a program called the domiciliary program for homeless veterans Mm -hmm. i went into that program for a year but they they I learned a lot of coping skills, a lot of, you know, uh, working through the problems. But what they did was they loaded me up with pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. medications, you know, Prozac. Which caused a lot of the problems in the beginning. Oh, my God. The the side effects alone Mm. were so excruciating because, yeah, they took away the depression. But they left you completely numb. You couldn't feel anything, not good, not bad, not anything. And honestly, I would rather cope with the problems that the feelings bring than not have any at all. I didn't mm-hmm. want to feel like a machine. Right, so right. I started self-medicating way before it was ever legal in an attempt to wean myself off of as many of these medications as I could. I was on almost 20 medications at one time. Wow. Not all of them were for, for psychological or emotional right. problems. A lot, of physical at, a lot of physical problems too. I was diabetic, really bad. Yeah. Um, I had heart problems lung infections that were hospitalized me three four times a year throughout the 90s it was a bad bad scene and then i started realizing that as i started using cannabis not as a recreational but but more just to if i knew i was going into a situation that was going to aggravate my ptsd and i pre-medicated prior to going there 
I was able to, to deal with the situation, deal with the people mm -hmm. without the side effects that the medicines were causing. Uh, and then when, when medicinal marijuana became legal here, uh, I got my medical card, and at the time there was only concentrates available. Mm -hmm. Now I got my disability, so I'm on a fixed income. Right. And it was literally costing me about a third of my monthly income, about $1,500 just to medicate using concentrates alone, concentrates okay. and pens and things like that. There had to be a better way. I just couldn't, it's not sustainable mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. So I was watching people on these YouTube videos and they were pressing rosin with hair straightening irons and things like that. And I thought it was mm. kind of a joke. So I kind of laughed it off and I was looking at maybe getting into doing BHO. Mm -hmm. But I live in an apartment building and that doesn't really lend itself to that sort of processing. What's BHO? Uh, butane hash oil. It's a gotcha. way of extracting the cannabinoids from the plant material using a solvent. Right. Uh, butane, propane, alcohol. There's a lot of different solvents that can be used to, to accomplish this. But then you're left with solvent in you're, your You're medicine. left with a solvent yeah. that has to then be purged either through mm -hmm. vacuum or temperature or both. And they're, even though they're supposed to purge all of it, there's still a detectable amount of residual uh, solvents in any commercial concentrate that you're going to buy. Right. With the kind of sensitivities that I have to chemical exposures now and my lungs being as damaged as they are, mm -hmm it made it problematic for me to be able to medicate effectively without damaging myself further. So yeah, yeah. I started getting serious about solventless ex extraction when I started seeing purpose-built equipment mm -hmm. that was made, not hair straightening arms, but actual presses that were specifically made to maximize your, your yield and quality. Sure. I was sitting around the house one day and I had, since I don't have to work, I basically got a big screen TV. I was sitting in front of it 18 hours a day, mm. melting my brain, yeah. just kind of marking time. My wife came in to me and she said, look, you need to get out of the house, find some friends and get a purpose in life again because I don't like seeing you like this. Mm -hmm. And something kind of snapped in my head, like a switch went off. And I said, mm. you know what? I'm going to do that. And I sold my TV and bought my first rosin press, <laughs> and I still you. haven't replaced the TV <laughs> two years later, right? So I bought, I bought a Nug Smasher Mini. It was a small two-ton, very portable press. It, it's made to press an eighth at a time, which is perfect for somebody who's just medicating for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I, through a lot of trial and error and ruining quite a few eighths <laughs> along the way in the learning process, I discovered after a while that I had sort of a talent for this. I, mm. I got my technique down. I, I understood that you need to watch what the plant's telling you as it's mm. as it's as you're extracting. The plant indicates when it's had enough heat, and if you if you pay attention to those things, you can make a very high quality concentrate that it has absolutely no residual chemicals no at all. No chemicals, right? And and getting your flour from the dispensary, you know exactly what's in it. Right. So now, that does the term solvent less. Correct. Correct. Right. We're just using heat and pressure. Okay. Okay. And you can accomplish with heat and pressure exactly the same thing they do with chemicals. It's not quite as efficient, mm -hmm. which is why commercial companies who make concentrates, they use chemicals because they get all of the material all at once mm -hmm. in one shot and then the plant material's done. Mm -hmm. When you use, when you use a rosin press to extract, you get your immediate concentrate, right? But then the pucks that are left over, the byproduct of this process mm -hmm. is also medicinally valuable. Mm. So I save up those pucks. They have a residual amount of THC and the other cannabinoids in them. And when I get enough of them, I extract them in a batch into coconut oil. Liquid mm. coconut mm -hmm. oil is the most bioavailable oil. Mm -hmm. And because I press so many different strains, unlike most edibles that are made by commercial companies where it's you know, one particular strain that they use, and that's fine, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. My edibles tend to be an order of magnitude more potent because we're talking 25 or 30 different strains that comprise the oil that goes into my so edibles. So really maximizing the entourage effect. Uh, not only that, but I'm also getting every last 
bit of medicinal value mm. from that plant, and because the byproducts are also medicinally valuable, I'm I'm stretching every dollar, which is the reason I got it. Well, that's what I was going to say. That like the the main thing, that your main purpose now with, and especially to help veterans, is this costs less. To, to consume it this way. Is that how, tell me it, the, the okay. finances on it, that. It's, it's real yeah. simple. And I can only speak for myself. Everybody's everybody's different. Your mileage yep. may vary. But for me, <laughs> if if I go to the dispensary and I get a, uh, an eighth of flour mm-hmm. and I take it home and I use it in the way that they designed it to be used, which is dry vaping Bite only because right. you can't smoke it here. Right. It would medicate me effectively for about half a day. The now, whole eighth. The whole eighth. Wow. Okay. Okay. Because that's, I mean, if you look at it, it's really only, you know. Three and a half grams. Yeah. yeah. So it, it spread out throughout a day. That's, you know. But if you take that same eighth and you put it through my press and you get anywhere close to a gram mm-hmm. of concentrate from that, mm-hmm. that same concentrate will medicate me for three solid days. Wow. So it, it's. So you're tripling the tripling, potency. And then well, you still have the, the pucks. And then exactly, yeah. and then and then I I have the pucks for later, and I can make the edibles, and the edibles yeah. are incredibly potent. And then yeah. I also, all of the equipment that I use to extract and to vape this product, I clean it instead of using isopropyl alcohol, which mm-hmm. is what most people use. Mm-hmm. I use 190 proof Everclear because it's food grade, mm-hmm. so it makes an instant tincture <laughs> that is medicinally available. <laughs> and here's the best part. If I get it to the point of saturation where I've got enough material in there where it just won't hold any more, uh-huh. I can take that tincture, put it into a slow cooker, boil the alcohol off, and I've got Rick Simpson oil, mm. which, again, because of the 25 or 30 different strains that comprise it, mm-hmm. make it an order of magnitude more potent uh, than anything a dispensary can offer. So I'm able to get at every level a great medicinal value yeah. from one from purchase. One purchase. So, in all of this, we should emphasize is perfectly legal in the state of Pennsylvania because yep. you are here stinking up the front entrance <laughs> of this place with all of your the, all of your uh, medicine that you brought in, and yeah. you're actually pressing right here at the expo. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm pressing not just dispensary flour. I'm also pressing CBD flour and making oh, rosin from yeah, that that right. actually can be vaped right here on the spot mm. because there's no THC. It's legally purchased anywhere. Uh, I didn't know that CBD could produce a good rosin because I had no experience you know, with it. The flour is not really readily available in a lot of places. It's the- starting to become so in a lot of vape shops, and you'll mm-hmm. start seeing more CBD flour. There's more companies coming out with it now. Now that hemp is you know, a commercial right. crop, right. you're going to see a lot more of it. And, and the nice thing is, if you like doing concentrates, you can take the CBD flour, use the same exact process I do for, for medicating, and you mm-hmm. can make yourself a vapable concentrate concentrate that is actually very, very tasty if you've got mm-hmm. good material to start with. And that's the thing about the press. The reason you it's dangerous to do anything other than dispensary flour is because if the flour that you had was grown improperly or somebody used uh, chemicals on it, pesticides, when you concentrate that by pressing mm-hmm. it, you are concentrating all of those toxins. Okay, And for somebody like me, that is absolutely unacceptable. And the fact that hemp and uh, cannabis are both uh, used to extract heavy metals out of the soil, to remediate soil. Yes. Uh, I guess they used them around Chernobyl. Yeah. Uh, that is even worse. You know, so to, to put it, heavy exactly. metals into your system would be really You a can't disaster. trust, unless you know who grew your flower, mm-hmm. and you knew what nutrients they use, and that they don't use pesticides, until until that day comes, right. I'm going to stick with dispensary flour because yeah. I yeah. know exactly what's in it, and and it's a one stage process from flour right. to concentrate with no yeah. not adding anything, not taking anything away, and you're keeping the full plant profile. Mm-hmm. Every terpene remains intact if you do it properly. Mm-hmm. Now, you can over press, you can over temperature your press, and you can burn all your terpenes off, and what you end up with, it'll get you high. But it, all the medicinal, medicinal value has yeah. been, been ruined. Yeah. So, again, it's a learning process. Anybody can make rosin. You can take a hair straightening iron and mm. have a, a piece of um, parchment paper, and you can make rosin. Mm. 
But if you want to get really good quality medicine, it takes paying very close attention to the process, the, the, the color, the amount of activity going on as it's mm -hmm. extracting. Those are all indicators that you need to pay attention to. And then when you pull it at just the optimal time, right. you end up with a concentrate that is far superior, in my opinion, right. to any concentrate hmm. that any dispensary sells. Well, this is a great service you're doing, so for especially for veterans on a fixed income, but really anybody on a fixed income. I'm here to this educate. A, you're here to educate. So you have yeah. got a YouTube channel. I do. I'm also you, on Instagram. Instagram. And you Facebook. keep a database online, is that I, right? I keep a database of all of my dispensary flower presses mm -hmm. I buy I, so I they're all eights they're all pressed at the same temperature 200 degrees mm -hmm. and uh, I buy from all different different grower processors sure. and different dispensaries too mm -hmm. uh, I mostly I mostly go to my tree but I, I do visit the other ones when they have flower that I'm particularly interested in mm -hmm. um, every press I do the database goes up and there's a link on my uh, Facebook that you can click anytime, a permalink okay. that'll that'll shoot you right to that page and you can see exactly what I'm getting in real time. Right. And that way you as a patient know when you're gonna if you're gonna try pressing some rosin, you know which flower now is mm -hmm. gonna give you the kind of, the results, kind of results that you're looking right, for. Right. Now of course, everybody's got their own favorite strain. And even if you get a strain that isn't a big producer, you can still get high-quality medication mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. You just won't get the kind of yield that you do off gotcha. of some of the others. And then you've discovered a trick that uh, I think is really valuable for people who might be complaining that the dry flower we get in Pennsylvania may be a little bit dry sometimes. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe. Maybe. Maybe a little maybe dry. Maybe the biggest understatement <laughs> I've ever heard. Uh, I'll tell so you. So you've got a trick to, to I do. Re rehydrate um, them. The when, you, when you're pressing in a rosin press, the optimal uh, moisture content of the flower has to be between 60 and 70 percent. Okay. okay. Generally speaking, when you get it from the dispensary, it's probably down to around 20, yeah. maybe. Okay, maybe the teens on some of the Allura and Terrapin. But most people take Bavita packs, which mm -hmm. are uh, an industry-wide, well-known. Mm -hmm. It's not really a Terrapin's rehydration. Shipping, shipping with them in. The, yeah. But here's the problem. Yeah. The, 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 things that are the chemical that they use in those packs to keep the moisture content steady mm -hmm. tends to degrade the terpenes. It uh, absorbs them as part of that process of stabilizing yeah. the, the, the uh, moisture content. Mm -hmm. So... When I uh, actually, I didn't discover this. This was this idea was given to me by a friend of mine who's a chiropractor. He's also a medical patient. He said, "Look, take spinach leaf, fresh spinach leaf, put it in the container with the flour. The, the container it comes in. He says it'll be ready to press in four to six hours." I was real dubious about that. You know, mm -hmm. I've been using Bavita packs. They work for me, but mm -hmm. they're very slow. Mm. By the, between the time I buy that flower and the time I can actually press it, if I'm using the Vita packs, it takes four to six days. Oh, okay. And for somebody like me, it's hard to sit on your medicine that long to make it right. usable. Right. Well, when he told me about spinach leaf, again, I said, well, I'll tell you what. Bring some over sometime and show me. <laughs> so he comes over one day and he has a, a an eighth of some Alira flower. And Alira is like one of the worst offenders as far as dryness goes, okay? okay? And he said, feel this. And I put my finger on there, and it was moist hmm. and sticky and smelled perfect and was ready to press and gave us an amazing yield when I put it through the press. Hmm. So I have become a believer. Spinach. I, Not just for Popeye anymore. Ex exactly. Yeah. It, it releases its um, moisture in a controlled but a quick manner. Hmm. And we, his flour, when he got it home from the dispensary, he threw it on a scale. It weighed 3.3 grams. Mm -hmm. So it was underweight because it was so dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After rehydration, in four hours, mm -hmm. it read at 4.2. <laughs> okay, it sucked well. up that, that moisture like a sponge. And I'm, I can tell anybody who has any inclination of pressing rosin with dispensary flour, you need to rehydrate it. Mm. And if you need it done quickly, mm. spinach. definitely use spinach. It no. is, it, and some it people works. have used lemon peels or, or that sort of thing. Nothing you wrong say with those things. They, they, work, they also but, work, but they impart a taste into the flour. They, right. they, they can affect the flavor of it greatly. And if you don't like the taste of lemon in your... It, exactly. Then, yeah. So uh, spinach is very neutral. It doesn't yeah. impart any kind of flavor, and it doesn't, it doesn't affect the terpenes at all. Yeah. And it, um, like I said, it just works really, really quick. 
And so there you have it, kids. Eat your spinach, and if you don't eat it, put it in your pot container. Oh, absolutely. So. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. I'm going to be doing two more two more dispensary flower presses today. Okay. One at about 2.30, 3 o'clock, and then probably one closer to 4 o'clock. Um, awesome. In between those times, I'll be pressing some CBD flour and making uh, CBD rosin that people can actually vape right here at the event. That's awesome. Well, Eric, it's really great to have you on the podcast. I'm so happy for what you're doing. Thank and you I very much. I appreciate all the work you're doing for the veterans. Uh, and for anybody on a fixed income, it's great, great resource. Love great educating, education. destigmatizing yep. this plant. Yeah. That's 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 what I'm here for. That's where we're all doing. We're all getting the stigma out. So Excellent. Now we know spinach is one of the keys. Indeed. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks all for right. being with us. Take care. That's it for this episode of the Dispense Magazine podcast. You can find all of Eric Asher's videos for each of his pressings on his YouTube channel, along with a link to his free online spreadsheet of pressing results. If you are in a legal state and you'd like to find a certifying physician or dispensary near you, visit dispensemagazine.com and search our free online database. You can find copies of our print magazine in every Pennsylvania dispensary, as well as dozens of doctor's offices, whole centers and retail locations across the state. To find out where or to read a copy online, visit dispensemagazine.com. I'm Sven Hosford. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Dispense Magazine, LLC.